Okay, good uh, afternoon, and uh, I'm sorry, good morning. <laughs> uh, I'm Dave Austin. I'm with the Sustainable Aurelia, and uh, we would like to share uh, a word from our president. And just bear with me. Uh, thank you for everyone who's joining this webinar uh, this morning. And uh, the uh, the president of Sustainable Aurelia, Stan Matheson, is uh, bidding. Um, he is pleased that uh, we are joining uh, to learn about some of the key issues and solutions that will help us move closer to a sustainable society. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is having a significant impact on many of us, our families, organizations, and businesses each day. But while COVID-19 is perceived as an immediate, in reality, so is the daily degradation of our planet and the long-term survival of all species on this planet. So long after COVID is part of our history, planet-wide degradation of climate, resources, species, and the way of life will be both an immediate reality and the uh, future for our descendants unless we change our behaviors now. And he's bidding us th uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, joining us uh, this morning. And I'm going to turn this over to uh, Tim Adamson, who's on the uh, energy and infrastructure uh, sector of Sustainable Aurelia. And uh, he will be introducing our guest speaker for this morning. Take it away, Tim. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to echo uh, David's comments and thank you very much for joining us this morning uh, and joining this webinar on Bullfrog Power. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to do a land acknowledgement uh, for our Indigenous people. <clears throat> we acknowledge that we are on traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples. I wish to recognize the long history of First Nations and Métis people in Ontario and show respect to them today. I would also like to specifically acknowledge the neighboring communities of the Chippewas of Georgina Island, Chippewas of Rama First Nation and the Beausoleil First Nation. So my name is Tim Adamson and as David said, I'm with Sustainable Aurelia on the infrastructure and energy sector. This webinar is part of Sustainable Aurelia months long celebrations and we're coming to the end of it. So we're very lucky to have David Barnes from Bullfrog join us today. I'm sure you will all have heard at least of Bullfrog Power. David will explain what this well-known company is all about and how they can help you do your part to promote renewable energy without breaking the bank. I believe that their service can fit in with a sustainable energy future for Aurelia. David brings significant experience in community energy planning today. If Aurelia is to survive economically as well as socially, we all need to start thinking about what our energy future is going to look like. Not just for where we live, but for, uh, but for our commercial and industrial businesses. There is no magic one bullet for us all here in Aurelia, but it will be a mix of solutions. The question is what should that mix look like? Increasing the use of renewable energy, and this can be both for electricity and natural gas, is just one of those options. So I will let David explain what this is all about. So on behalf of all of us here at Sustainable Aurelia, thank you, David, for being here and over to you. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, let me know uh, if my sound is okay. I think uh, we, we did a check before. Really happy to be here. So my name is Dave Borens, and I do have a slideshow, but just off the top, it, it, it's really wonderful to see uh, communities getting together and talking about these um, the possibilities of the future because it's by having these conversations and in any way we can have them uh, that, that change is made and that we are able to find uh, sort of a path forward to a, you know, a, a livable world, let's call it. So uh, I'm going to pull up my presentation and we'll all kind of, let's go from there. <laughs> and I'm going to get rid of my picture. And I... <laughs> Give me a second here.
So, just as a preamble, I wanted to uh, discuss a little bit about how, why I'm here and how I got here. Uh, what I will say is, um, you know, I, I came not from a scientific or uh, sort of engineering background. I started off as an, an artist, a, a musician, and believe it or not, I, I uh, have a special relationship with Aurelia because I had the privilege of performing at the Mariposa Folk Festival uh, at its 50th anniversary. And my, my, my set was opposite the final show by Gordon Lightfoot. Um, and we were playing in the bar tent with my sort of raucous band. And I, I, I had a, just have such a fond memory of one of the highlights of my pre-career career, as I, I like to refer to it as. Um, what happened though, was while I was you know, working as a, as a musician touring around Canada and, and North America, I started to get really concerned about the climate and climate issues. And I found that I was spending a lot more time reading about the climate and less time practicing music and writing songs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing that really kind of shook my brain was this image. And the reason why I bring it up and start here is because when we're talking about sustainability issues, storytelling and images are every bit as powerful as facts and data. So this is an image of a Kermode spirit bear, or as they call a spirit bear. It's in the Great Bear Rainforest in British Columbia. And I didn't realize that this was a real animal. I thought that it was a mythical being that I had read about as a kid. And when I saw these images, I was like, wow, this is a real animal. And then very interestingly saw it was in this National Geographic about the wildest place in North America, the land of the spirit bear. And if you look down on this um, image, you'll see that then they had an article called Pipeline Through Paradise. This is back in 2011. Um, and this is a, uh, this was a, a watershed moment for me because I was like, oh my goodness, this animal exists, this land is incredible. I wanna get there someday and experience it, but it's at risk because of pipeline politics. So I learned all about sort of, you know, it was a, a perfect example. And I can trace this image, this National Geographic, directly to my position here at Bullfrog and, and speaking to you all. Um, so just very, very briefly, I'm gonna go over the climate change stuff. I know that if you're in this uh, webinar, you probably have some idea, but the idea that the climate is changing is at this point irrefutable and that it's man-made uh, issue. As you can see what happens as more CO2 and other greenhouse gas concentrations exist in the, in the um, atmosphere, less of the, the, the outgoing infrared radiation, it gets trapped, it doesn't bounce back. And, and the more, and it's you know, a cyclical cycle that it just becomes uh, a feedback loop where the, the more melting, the, the, the more absorption the water has and the less uh, reflective surfaces exist on, in the ice caps and it has a lot of repercussions as we all I'm sure are aware of. And just to talk about what our problem here is, is that the largest source of global warming pollution is burning of fossil fuels. And you know, it's no question that the burning of fossil fuels has ushered in the most remarkable era of development and prosperity in the history of the world. But we also, I believe, and this is what we're gonna talk about, have the ability to get off of them. And, and that's our only uh, hope of survival. <laughs> so all is not lost. Again, we're gonna run through here. Um, the, the the preamble then i'll talk about bullfrog power but this is you know part of the issue is what we're trying to do and that's renewable energy and the proliferation of renewable energy but all is not lost in 1980 at t commissioned a study to forecast cell phone use by the year 2000 and they projected there'd be almost a million users you know 900,000 users by the year 2000. the actual figure was 109 million so 120 times higher than, um, than they were expecting. So the forecast in 1980 was way off. And right now there are over more and more cell phone connections than there are people. And I think that this is an important thing to think about when we talk about the transition to renewable energy. And here's, uh, here's the reasons why they were so wrong and they didn't see the future the way they maybe should have being as the largest telecom company in the world. Why were they wrong? <laughs> um, one, so the cost drops. 
and then the quality improved dramatically, and then low-income nations with no landline grids leapfrogged the old technology. And this is exactly the path we're seeing in solar, wind, and other renewable energies. This is, the, this is what we're seeing with battery technology. This is what we're seeing with electric vehicles. The cost is dropping, the quality is improving, and many nations that, well, not with vehicles necessarily, but nations that they no longer have to build the power lines um, across vast you know, deserts and, and jungles, they, they can use satellite technology. So they leapfrog the old technology. And now in developing countries, everybody's got a cell phone where they may not have had any connection. And now in developing countries, everybody can have power using decentralized microgrids. And so this is a, an old prediction and they were correct. So Morgan Stanley is saying, was saying in 2017 that by this year, 2020, renewables will be the cheapest form of new power generation across the globe. And I have seen numbers that say that it is now cheaper to build wind, it's now cheaper to build solar than it is to build coal and even natural gas. It's, it's outperforming price-wise on a utility scale. And that is exciting because that means that the market, as everybody likes to talk about, the market is going to take care of it because why on earth would you use a more expensive and polluting energy? But it's just a matter of timing and and and, dereg and the appropriate regulatory framework for that to happen. So now I'm going to jump into Bullfrog Power, talk a little bit about who we are, what we're doing, and how you can be part of it. What's important is that we're trying to make this change happen and have been, this is our 15th year anniversary, we've been trying to make the change on the grid level, not uh, in on the individual level. So if you are signing up for Bullfrog Power, as we'll talk about, our mission is to inspire and empower businesses and individuals to lead the way in creating our newly powered future. Um, and that's sort of what we think of. And this is our mission statement. Okay. There is a video that I was, any, I, I'm worried the sound isn't going to work. So if you go, I'm just going to stop sharing for a second. If you go, there's a, 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 um, a video link in your handout, which is at the bottom of your screen. It's a little thing. If you move your mouse down, you can press play and you can watch this video on your own screen that makes, makes sure the sound works. So I'm going to tr try and time it. It's a two minute video. And I think that uh, this is a chance for everybody to participate and see this little video that it gives a really good overview without any babbling that I'm prone to of, of how Bullfrog Power works. So I'm going to time it on my cell phone and we're going to go for two minutes. Everybody, if you can click on the video link at the bottom and I'm going to play it on our screen so you can kind of see how it's going. Um, so five, four, three, two. One, let's see if this works for everybody.
Okay, so either you have, were able to hear the sound through my computer, which I'm going to guess wasn't the case, or you've watched the video or have planned to watch the video and had a, a quick bathroom break. That's okay. Um, basically, what it's saying, and just a quick recap, is that Bullfrog Power sees how much power you're using either through natural gas, electricity, or transport fuel, and injects that power onto the grid on your behalf through a mechanism called a renewable energy certificate. So we procure the certificate from Eco Logo certified projects in the amount of energy that you are using, and we retire those certificates, which means that the carbon credit associated with the green power is now claimed by you, the individual and or business that is purchasing Bullfrog Power. Um, long story short is we match your usage on the grid from renewable sources and from renewable sources across Canada. So it's important to know that, um, you know, some of the mix of what you're getting, we try and pull renewable sources from dirtier grids. For instance, Alberta is a much dirtier grid than Ontario. Uh, East, East Coast, you know, the maritime provinces tend to be dirtier grids with the exception of New Brunswick, but each province has their own mix. And we're trying to be as local to you as possible and also mixing in uh, carbon reductions from places like Alberta and Saskatchewan and places with higher levels of CO2 in their grids. Um, obviously, that's a whole other topic. So here's the green products in sort of a, a quick overview. We have green electricity, that's the classic. That's um, a blend of wind, low impact hydro, sourced from new Canadian facilities, uh, it's pollution free, addresses scope two emissions. What we is not even on the slide yet, but we now actually have solar in that mix as well. And that's been sort of a holy grail for us to get utility scale solar credits. Um, they, they, they just didn't quite exist on the size we needed to source them from. Green natural gas, sourced from biomethane captured organic landfill waste. It's a climate friendly natural gas injected under the nas national pipeline, the half of your organization. Natural gas is still a CO2 creating entity as is green fuel. What we're doing is recycling stuff that's already part of the carbon cycle as opposed to digging up or fracking for more. Um, and, you know, it's a transition. Uh, natural gas is not a solution, it's a transition, but it'd be better to have less, uh, you know, less emissions connected to it. Same with green fuel, but green fuel is derived from waste streams from food and feed manufacturing processes. It's put into the Canadian fuel system. Um, so this is, you know, usually used by people who have a gas car, can't afford an electric car, um, or have a hybrid and, and want us to kind of supplement. It's also used by businesses with, let's say, a delivery fleet. Um, this is our newest of, our, of, the, of the three products. So there's not a ton of adoptions, it's a little bit more expensive than the other two, but it, it's certainly a way of pushing more renewable fuel into the system. Um, some of our commercial customers, this is sort of who we're working with. Um, you know, Muskoka Brewery, Steam Whistle, Bose, those are names that jumped out. MEC, although uh, from what I hear, MEC is on the ropes right now, so we'll see if that logo stands for very long. The big banks are using us. Unilever has been historically a huge client. Google, um, so, you know, really ethical bean coffee. It's a whole mix of, of corporate organizations that have sustainability goals that they're trying to meet. And also, um, you know, businesses like ethical bean coffee, um, Skoker, Steam Whistle, Bose, uh, Nature's Path, these are all brands, Lush, these are brands that uh, environmentalism is is inside their their DNA, and they're just trying to um, use you know bullfrog is often used as a marketing benefit. But one of the reasons why we're so popular and why we've been successful is because a lot of our programs were developed with you know, in consultation with environmental organizations like David Suzuki, WWF, Pemina. These are customers as well as people we support. You can see more smaller organizations below. Um, what's really, this is so important because often if we have a new uh, product or are considering, you know, various, you know, decision-making things, we'll consult with our, our contacts to see, hey, does, does this um, coincide with the, your values and, and will this, you know, what's the best way to do this? For instance, we have a, um, 
uh, an, an, an offset company. It's a subsidy of Bullfrog called Less Emissions. Now, Less Emissions is the primary offset provider for Air Canada, primary offset provider for a lot of um, people in Canada. They and, and, and the truth is that offsets, their impact is questionable and they should only be used um, for you know, creating emissions that you can't avoid, right? So when you're doing bullfrog power, you're avoiding the creation of the emissions. With less, you're, you're emitting and then making up for it somewhere else. Um, but we still wanted to make sure they were of high quality. So you know, building up our, our offset platform is, was done so in consultation with, with our environmental groups. Another thing about Bullfrog that is important and, and sort of a, a really huge path forward is that we were purchased. Uh, we were a private company owned by a, a sort of an environmental social justice sort of board of directors. They were, we were sold to an electrical organization called Spark Power. Now, because we're part of a much larger organization, all of a sudden we have a lot more capability in terms of actually building things. Bullfrog Power historically has been buying and selling these renewable energy certificates. Now we actually are associated with a company that has guys in trucks and women in trucks and going and, and fixing electricity grids and installing new capacities and being, you know, sort of working in, in industry. So the opportunities moving forward of integrated power solutions is pretty, um, pretty amazing. And Bullfrog Power is basically going to be the sustainability brand within Spark Power Spark has bought a lot of companies and they've left us alone to do what we do and enhanced us by giving us more avenues for which to pursue new things. Um, st some of the things that we're trying to do include virtual power purchase agreement organizations uh, who are trying to um, find more efficiency in, in their businesses um, and you know, helping to convert fleets to electric vehicles. So there's stuff that's not traditional bullfrog that we're finally being able to do. We've had wish lists for our entire career. Oh, wouldn't it be amazing if we could actually install solar or we could actually um, you know, research new technologies and implement them with clients. So these are, this, is gonna give, this is giving us the opportunity. So you can expect more to be rolled out soon. Um, one of the things that I'm most passionate about is community projects. Now. I, I should say that I, I believe that Aurelia, well, I know Aurelia, the community center, you had a new community center and you had applied to for a community project grant and didn't receive that grant. And I, I've always felt guilty because I thought it was a great project, but it's just the type of thing where we have so many people applying for grants um, and our board of directors just, you know, they pick horses. And, and so apologies to all of you if, if you were part of that development. I certainly am interested to do projects in, Aurelia. So this is a relic of original Bullfrog, where we are finding projects that are interesting, tell amazing stories, and we help, we just give them grant money or support or marketing support across the country. I'm just going to talk a, a few about these. These include, oh, before I get into some of these ones, this is uh, our most recent project that we're supporting. This is part of our mix. So we, we haven't given them a grant. We're actually paying the First Nation in Manitoba's biggest solar farm, we're buying the RECs, and that's why RECs are, or solar RECs are now part of our mix. But we're really excited about it. It's, it's a megawatt, so industrial scale. It's a great opportunity for, um, for the band to increase employment and will make a cleaner uh, grid for that community. But that's just a really recent project uh, that was in the news quite recently, so I threw it in there. It's part of our community project. But here's some other ones. Oxford Community Energy Co-op. So Woodstock, Ontario is a wind farm. It was a, um, a cooperative uh, and a couple years back. So the cooperative, uh, the community of farmers owns, uh, you know, a controlling share in the co-op and they're continuing to build more interesting stuff. Uh, Kubi Public School in Toronto. You can see a picture of the rooftop of this public school. Um, the children were going to the school. Their parents wanted to implement some renewable energy. So they started a cooperative to build solar projects and they sold bonds. And it took them so long to build this thing that the kids had already graduated by the time it was finished. But we were able to help them put it over the edge with financial support and we purchased some, some of the uh, bonds. Balkan, Alberta, this is um, a, historically a grain, um, th this was a center place where they held all the grain storage. Uh, and and you know they would then get distributed across the country, and so they wanted to build 
it's also the Star Trek capital of, of the world. Basically, they have a, a replica enterprise, but they wanted to honor their history and show the future forward. So they built a solar park. So this is in, on a brown zone, it used to be, I think, a gas station. And you can see in the back, they actually designed the solar panels to look like um, to look like the grain elevators that used to house in the area and distribute that grain. So it's a nod to their past while uh, you know, pointing to the future. Uh, really love this one. This is an inner city Halifax organization that helps youth do urban farming in one of the first black communities in Canada. Uh, and, and so they were actually on Dragon's Den selling um, selling salad dressing that they from ingredients that they grew in the, grew in the greenhouse. We're actually in talks with this organization to do uh, a, a second phase of the project to expand their solar energy uh, to lower their expenses. And you know, Nova Scotia has a very uh, fossil fuel heavy grid, so any solar there has a big impact. I lost the First Nation. This is um, near Peterborough. This is the old railroad stop. This was done um, to showcase again where the the nation is is moving forward. It's you know a central hub in the community. We really uh, really had a great time working with them. Uh, and the last one. This is my personal favorite, not only because I got to go and experience the opening of this and and the uh, Indigenous Peoples Days Haida Heritage Center. It's the largest at the time. It's a couple years old largest community owned project in BC. Uh, you can see the rooftops. This is the largest building on the islands of Haida Gwaii. Haida Gwaii is, the, is one of the most remarkable places. Um, and, and you know they're really at the center of the resistance and, and uh, movement for indigenous rights and acknowledgement. So it's really uh, special to support a community trying to, again, utilize the, the sun and the elements to change almost their, the history moving forward, because, you know, Haida Gwaii, it's a remote place. I think it, at the time, and I, I hope this is a little bit better, but I'm, I'm not convinced they've, they've made much progress. At the time, over 75% of this island chain, which is an island chain, there's probably only five or six, under 10,000 people on the whole group of the islands. Combined, the islands are about the size of the Hawaiian islands. They're just sort of in a different configuration. So there's a lot of land there and they're almost over 75 percent diesel powered so it's a huge um you know there, there's always ships moving in and out of the strait to deliver um deliver oil you know so there's the risk of environmental catastrophe a very fragile ecosystem quite high so they're really pushing for more renewable energy there's lots of amazing things going on there as well okay here we go um <laughs> the big finish here you know, I always talk about this terrible movie I saw when I was about five or six years old. This is Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. Now, Superman, this is widely considered one of the worst films ever made. <laughs> Superman takes a little, uh, you know, little kid he's helping out on a flyover on the, on the, on the, uh, over the earth to look at the, the world. He doesn't have an oxygen oxygen tank or anything. It's, it's amazing he survived. And for some reason, everything he says is being broadcast, I guess, through Superman speakers uh, into the UN. So he's talking to the whole world. And, and Superman asks this little kid, let's call him Jimmy, I forget his name. He asks the kid, what, is, what do you see, Jimmy? He says, I, I, I look down and I, I see forests and I see oceans and I see, see uh, the clouds and I, I see the ice. And I can't see where one country begins and another country ends. Now, my adult brain says, oh, that's kind of like a cheesy, but you know, sentimental line. When I was like five or six years old, this like blew my mind. I'm like, oh my goodness, borders are just a construct. You know, it really affected me as, as a kid and I even had it in a picture book. Um, it wasn't a good movie, judge of, judge of quality at the time. But it, it's, it's never been so true than with this issue of climate change. You know, we, we all have a role to play um, in acting, you know, we, we, we think globally, we act locally. And I think that's part of what Bullfrog Power enables you to do um, in, your, in your business or your home. Um, and so, you know, we always talk about with great power becomes great responsibility. That's the Spider-Man line. I always like to think of more, you know, in a different way. Those are the capacity to act, to act, have a moral imperative to do so. And I think that that's uh, 
really important to think about it. like what can we do and this is a small thing but it's a meaningful thing to do if you're to do so uh one last thing uh, for the climate deniers out there this is a article from 1912 and what do they say they said coal consumption is affecting the climate this is before the first world war uh the first world war was probably the first major climate dump uh so this is even before that happened furnaces of the world are now burning about two billion tons of coal a year when this is burned you know uniting with oxygen it adds about seven billion tons of co2 to the atmosphere yearly this tends to make the air a more effective blanket for the earth to raise its temperature the effect may be considerable in a few centuries um well it's considerable now and it's what a perfect perfect description of climate change and you know we knew about it in 1912 and probably that so this is my final slide any questions is an adorable it's not a bullfrog i know it's a tree frog um, but you can reach out to me uh, and i'm sure there's some questions and i'm going to stop sharing my screen and and maybe we'll, we'll uh, have some time to chat um make sense for everybody okay thank you for listening to that stream of consciousness okay. now let me see how i can get back into um Hello. Thank you very much, uh, David. That was a very uh, inspirational presentation. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, actually, it's just as a, we've got a couple of questions on the right hand side that you see in the chat. But before we go there, it has always been put to me that with climate change, we, we're managing climate change using 1830s type government structures to solve a 21st century problem. So, uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I never even, I never thought of it in that in that way. It's absolutely right. You know, maybe so, why so anyway, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, an in inspirational introduction. So thank you very much. Uh, there's a question about separate invoicing. Um, so how does that? I mean, if I'm if I buy Bullfrog Power, say natural gas for my house, mm -hmm. then I get I get two invoices, one from Enbridge. And then one from you guys, but yes. is that just for the volume? I mean, could you so 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 you are essentially we we've, we've tried to make it simple. There are people who, particularly on on the on the home front, we usually say, okay, an average detached home uses this, an average townhouse would use this, an average uh, apartment would use this much. What you could do is actually look at your bills, see how much you're using, and report that to us. And we'll tailor it exactly to your usage. For businesses, we're much more uh, strict on this. We we don't want a business to say we are Bullfrog Power when they're actually only purchasing you know a small percentage of what they're actually using. For homes, we we say okay, these are the averages. This is your home. So so you're on a set monthly uh, charge, and then you can adjust it by just reaching out to us. It's kind of the honor system in, in that respect. And yes, it's a separate invoice. It doesn't show up on your Enbridge bill or on your hydro bill. It's it's uh, completely voluntary, which which is a, it's good to know because uh, let's say you're renting, you could still do it even if you're not paying, uh, you know, if you're not paying the bills, if that's included in your rent, you could do it separately without consulting your landlord. We're not installing anything; it's all on the back end. So it's it's a, like a personal subscription you can do, and it won't affect anything else. So it'll be a certain percentage. So if I'm renting, and uh, I'd say, okay, 20%, I want to have Bullfrog Power, and then you just calculate it. Well, you, you would, let's say you're in a in a fourplex, that means you're in an apartment, so you'd use the apartment metric, right? You know, you'd use the condo metric for your, okay, like, you, know, right. you know, you wouldn't do the whole place uh, unless you're really generous, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, and, and, and you could also figure out by square footage, you say how much energy is used per square foot, so if you're in, you know, a thousand square feet, and it's like, 16 kilowatt hours of square footage, then 16,000 kilowatt hours is 16 megawatt hours. And so you average that out over a, uh, a year, you know, so divided yeah. by 12 and that's your usage. That's so it, that's that's right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's another question here about, uh, do you find that people who subscribe to Bullfrog Power are those who don't have an option of installing solar panels and want to go green? Uh, you see yeah. the question. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I see that right there. Um, that is a, a really common thing we hear. It, 
think, you know, so again, that rental scenario, you're not able to put something on your roof, you know, because your landlord says no, um, that this is a, a good thing. What we also see is we're planning on doing solar panels. We're, you know, trying to get there by in, in the next couple of years, and we're going to use Bullfrog Power to transition there. Uh, or we're, we've got solar panels on our roof, and the solar panels are accounting for 70% of our power usage. So we just want that 30%, and we'll use Bullfrog for that 30%. You know, so so okay. it's a, so it, it's it's a very flexible in in that sense. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So then uh, back to sort of community uh, uh, energy planning. So a comment here is that uh, we're going to be back with the Aurelia Rec Center project. Well, Gordon, hi. We I have not forgotten. <laughs> I, and, and I, 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 I definitely think you should resubmit. I'm I'm serious because it, it's it's always a, a just a weird timing thing. And, and I, I certainly hope that I'd love to get an update. So we should schedule a call. Uh, and I, I do, uh, I have not forgotten, Gordon. <laughs> so to, so we'll follow up uh, after this webinar uh, with you, you know. But uh, you've got 140 community plans. So what's your rec? I mean, apart from the rec center at Aurelia, mm -hmm. you have a foundation of, you know, how we could go about doing something like that? So, so that was 140 community projects, uh, meaning projects that have developed because of our funding and grants and a, a sort of invest, you know, a little bit of investment, but mostly it's grant funding. Uh, in terms of building a community plan, um, I think that it's, it's really important to have one, first of all. I, I, I guess that is, how, how do you go about it? I'm, I'm, I'm not a civic planner, so I, I don't, I don't know that very well. What I would say is I could try and look up some resources. I do know people who have worked on those things, particularly in indigenous communities. And I assume that it would be maybe a, a larger scale for a town like Aurelia, but, um, but it would be a similar process of, of sort of assessing, you know, various sites around town of that, that could potentially be used for renewable energy. Um, how many, you know, how many roofs are, are available? You look at every roof in the whole, whole town. Uh, you, you you can see you know does does the lake have any tide which I don't think it's Kuchiching right it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't have a lot of tide <laughs> you wouldn't want to destroy that beautiful waterfront um, and uh, you know does and and you know how much you, know, you you try and maybe assess you know are the restaurants is there enough waste fuel that could be gathered can there be like some like a city um, option to recapture that. Uh, transport fuel to you know that could be a, a resource that's organized at a at a municipal level. There's many um, you know sort of building codes and things like that are are really important. And all the efficiency pieces, having um, you know having EV charging technology at at a you know at every gas station. Um, you know having you know so like having bike lanes, all all the all the all the fun things. Uh, there's a lot of. <laughs> is there, is, uh, anyway, so the, so the, the, what I, I think that there's maybe I'll, I'll I'll try and search for sort of like a, a um, an outline of like what a community plan looks like, and maybe you can just kind of plug and play from there. You know, using using the opportunities. I, I would imagine that politically, there's if if there's a will, there, there's probably some element of this going on anyway. I, I would imagine. But obviously. Not Eyes on okay. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. Um, so there's a question yeah. about RNG competition, and you see the question there. So, you know, are they competitive with Enbridge at two dollars a month? You know, how, how, how would that work? So, okay, so so the Enbridge is getting you know, there's a flood of, of what we would call low quality wrecks, right? So, so there's there, these are not constrained by some of our our self constraining and quality um what do you call it like okay so every every, every facility has to be eco logo certified everything has to be uh create every electricity or, or natural gas has to be created within a calendar year has to be certain uh distance from you has to be out of the path of um of migratory birds there's a bunch of things that we put ourselves to make sure that we're we're having the most high quality 
energy on the market. And I do believe that that two dollars a month will doesn't cover the entire entirety of the footprint, and and it may do so in a way that um, I, I like. I I have to look into it because I haven't. I, I heard about this relatively recently, and and I think that it it, it is kind of apples to oranges. But at the same time, it's better than doing nothing. So so I think that they're they're moving forward in a in a good way. Um, I'm, I, I do believe, like, I, I, I'm, one of the things we see is that, is that people, particularly at, at, a, at a, a huge scale, come to us and say, well, you know, I can get this for, you know, a fraction of the price uh, from Texas or something, you know, like from areas that are, are um, just pumping out wrecks at, at a very low quality. And they, they have, like, there's a, a long historical tale where if you haven't claimed the energy reduction from like 10 years ago, you can still kind of use it in the mix. So I, I would read the fine print. Um, I don't, I, I do believe it's a step in the right direction and it, it may or may not, um, I, I have to look into it more is my question, yeah. is, is my yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was just announced by the OEB uh, probably a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago, so it's probably a bit of an unfair question, you know. Yeah. It's, well, no, but, it, but it, it, it's, uh, uh, it's obviously, you know, uh, what it shows is that there's more and more people trying to um, make change, which is which is yeah. good. There's, yeah. a, there's, there's an appetite for it, and so the more people who have the ability to find ways to lower their carbon footprint, and the more that somebody like Enbridge is doing so, is is yeah. is good. And Enbridge is you know they're they're a, <laughs> I, you know they're they're a very large oil and gas organization that is trying to do their best to transition. Uh, some are doing better than others. I'd say Enbridge is doing better than some and not as good as others. They're still trying to build pipelines, but they're also trying to build out their solar portfolio. Um, and, you know, much of Aurelia's power comes from Aurelia power generation, different hydro plants, amazing, several solar stations. Advantages to using Wolfhawk power. Uh, electricity may not be, like, like, okay, so the advantages in this case are you might be helping somewhere outside of Aurelia. But if you're you know, worried about Aurelia itself, it, it sounds like you have a fairly clean energy um, supply, which is excellent. I, I, it's also worth looking into how impactful are these dams. Uh, some are better than others. We, we like low impact hydro versus the big large scale ones. I'm not 100% certain, but I do believe that, um, you know, what's true in Aurelia is not necessarily true in other places. And, and, and so, it may be that in Aurelia, you have a very clean electricity system, but the natural gas would be the thing to do, or you're driving a lot, so it's the transport fuel that you should be doing. Or, you know, so, so it, it, you know, it, you gotta do what, what's right for you. Um, yeah. Also, uh, we try and do a lot of other stuff, um, including for businesses, you know, marketing programs and community project piece as well. So do we sign up for Bullfrog or the rec center solar panels, or is there a way to transition? Um, yeah, sign up for both. Of them. And <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I think that um, I'm, I'm just joking. The, you know, I think is how is like you know I do want to hear how the rec center is developing in terms of the, the solar product because I do I do I really like that project and I certainly um, didn't I, I do I do want to find a way to support it. It's sometimes out of my hands is, is all I can say. I will uh, we'll have a commitment to contact you afterwards. Yeah, bug me. Uh, that you know, um, I've just been reminded that the Narrows, so that's uh, you know, uh, does have a constant current, so that's between Kuchiching and Lake Simcoe, you know, so that's an option. Uh, <laughs> but, you would, but you wouldn't want to dam that, no, <laughs> maybe so, you know, you, you, yeah, be, you, know. <laughs> you, you, you probably want to have so, a um, low and impact. What are the options? So community uh, project, going back to solar, you could have a bunch of different solar panels on a number of different buildings and then tie them together. And that would be a community, that could be a community project, would it? Or does Sure. I, I mean, or, like, you know, what, what we define community projects as is, is uh, you know, cooperatively owned, municipally owned, um, not-for-profit owned, or indigenous owned. So, so it, it yeah. could be, you know, the rec center definitely qualifies. <laughs> Uh, right. You, you know, it's it's just a you know a resource issue. Well, I think that's a hundred. That's a hundred uh, kilowatts, right? Right. Uh, I think so. That would be big enough. 
So is that a, is that the minimum size limit? I see. There's a question. No, here. some of them are much smaller. Like sometimes oh, they're, they're. Oh yeah. No, some of them are are, are very. <laughs> well, from your 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 uh, presentation, that greenhouse obviously is about ten kilos. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like like you know, so, so particularly before we were able to have solar in our mix that we're offering consumers, we wanted to just have great stories about solar that we're supporting. So some of them, is particularly in, in remote places, are quite small, but like impactful and interesting, you know? Um, it's just about storytelling, really. Um, yeah. You know, the, and, and that's, how about a turbine at the Narrows? No need to dam there. Well, yeah, I don't know. I always say the, you know, less is more, <laughs> but you know, like you don't wanna, but who knows? I, I'm, I'm not a engineer. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> <not> <laughs> <my engineer. laughs> right. No, but um, you know, because we are in the process of trying to evaluate uh, eventually sort of solar potential for different roofs. Mm -hmm. um, so in doing this community planning, uh, uh, do you provide grants to help, you know, sustainable really is a non profit organizations. So yeah. we don't have money. So we come to you in part, you know, say with FCM or something, say, look, we we're trying to develop a, you know, the best option, you know, of what the mm -hmm. best is. You know, is that something you guys could help us with or so so I may, may, maybe like like you know I, I would I would need to Put it forth and, and, and try and try and make it happen. The, the two things here's the, the inside track is the two areas because of our association with Spark Power, we have new capabilities that we'd like to show off. So so it, it expands the um, the scope of what we're able to fund or willing to fund. And I know for a fact that we're trying to find an in, an electronic vehicle project. So if it's to do with electronic vehicle infrastructure, charging stations, etc., that would be um, something of, of interest and and then also uh, efficiency items so if there's there's an efficiency pro program we, we're, we're trying to at least workshop efficiency um, advisory systems so I, I think that there is an appetite for that um, if and and in terms of you know I, I think also it, it's it's a uh, it's also a little bit of a crapshoot because I take things forward that I think are great and sometimes they shoot them down and I take things forward that are that I think are, are well, I'm just going to put this forward. They're like, oh, that sounds great. So you so sort of never well, know. Well, both, uh, I mean, I, I, and we'll take this offline, but yeah. both EV charging stations and efficiency programs are both of interest to Sustainable Aurelia. We've actually got other projects involved in that. So, mm -hmm. so we'll come back and have a chat. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I'm just looking at the time here. Um, and are there any other questions from the uh, attendees on the, on the chat line there? I'm just looking. I don't see anything. You saw the one about the uh, putting in a turbine and the narrows. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, I don't see anything. Everybody's OK. Well, with that, um, I would like to Thank you very much, Dave, for, for this presentation. Uh, it's really, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, you could send me the video link so I can share it with everybody. Sure. I'm going to put uh, it right in the chat, actually. And uh, it was really, uh, really good, very inspirational. And thank I you. Really it. So, and thank you very much. And we'll be in touch. Uh, okay. Some point about these uh, others. Like okay. what I, what I, yeah, just wishing you all you know health and 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 security. It's a it's a really strange time. I, my hope is that the you know with everybody traveling locally, that it really is is sort of beneficial in terms of local establishments with the pandemic going on. But I I, I just you know it's 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 wild out there, and and I hope everybody's well. And thank you for uh you know thank you for having me here. someday hopefully I'd love to to stop by and, and speak to the a room full of people it's it's more fun that way but but i i do uh, i do really appreciate you putting this together okay no thanks very much appreciate that okay so with that uh, i'll bring this webinar to a close thanks okay right bye bye